going to call us to order here. Um, we, we, we start in ti on time when I have the gavel in this room. Um, we do have all day, which is better than a normal day. So I will call this meeting of the conference committee on Senate file 2909 to order. We do have a quorum present. Um, we do side by sides are coming in hot. Um, and as soon as we have them, um, they will be posted online, um, as soon as possible so that the public can see them. We also haven't seen them yet. Um, but, uh, staff are double checking things. So we'll make sure people see those, uh, as soon as they can. Uh, so today we're going to hear uh, from some people that were uh, that will be directly impacted by um, some of the fiscal provisions in Senate File 2909. Um, different conferees have requested some additional testimony from some folks, and so we're going to several provisions where the House and the Senate differ. So we're going to um, hear some from, from some folks and help. Hopefully, that will help us uh, move even closer uh, to some more agreements. Uh, so I will call the names uh, of the testifiers that are signed up to speak on the fiscal provisions that um, folks had questions about, um, and then uh, conferees will have a chance to ask questions and discuss uh, after each testifier. Uh, so with that, uh, we will get started. The first person I have on the list is uh, Antonio Espinosa uh, to speak to Art from the Inside. Uh, so if uh, Mr. Espinosa, if you could come on up. Good morning, uh, Mr. Espinosa. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, and I, I know I'm looking forward to hearing about Art from the Inside again, but some other members maybe haven't heard your pitch before. So uh, please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. No. Yeah, try the other one. Hello, hello? No, yeah. that one's better. <laughs> Sounds like when I was working in the, in the, in the institution. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Antonio Espinoza, and I am happy to be here. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Madam Chair uh, and committee, to uh, let me have a conversation with you this morning. Um, my name is Antonio Espinoza, and I'm a former retired correctional officer over at Stillwater Prison. I worked for the Department of Corrections for 19 and a half years and I retired in 21. Um, I'm here in support of, uh, support of Arch Grants programming, um, and this, this, this uh, will give us an opportunity, this, this grant will give us an opportunity to help our incarcerated folks who are incarcerated in our state uh, for better opportunities through arts. Um, my story begins in 2018, my friend was murdered by the hands of an incarcerated person at Stillwater Prison, and that triggered me to do something outside of my scopes of my duties uh, to try to bring healing and, and uh, uh, transformation in the in the uh, in the people that we serve, uh, and also within our staffing as well. Um, Joseph Gom was murdered, and his life was precious to a lot of us. And you know, from his sacrifice, something good has to come out of this. So I was, I was committed to be creative enough to, to come out and, and be, being creative in, in trying to bring out the, uh, the best out of people. Uh, we, we talk about people who are incarcerated, who are, who are bad people, but there's a lot of transformation that happens inside the prison system that we don't know about. Uh, we just hear about the things that people do and, and they get into the system, but we don't hear about the, the good things that, they, that happens through their time in prison. Uh, being that I worked there for 19 and a half years, I did see the bad and I did see the good. Uh, the good part comes with uh, art that these people could create. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the art that, the, a lot of the, my conversations with these folks has turned out to be that art is a, a healing, uh, healing, a transformational uh, thing that they go through um, and it gives them an opportunity to escape from what their, their realities of where they're at today. And uh, it creates it creates a, a safer environment for our institutions. It creates a community for those who are in that situation. Uh, and I'm hoping to to create a 
culture change in the system in our in our state. Uh, our state is in need of more programming, uh, and I think art from the inside is, is, is would be a great asset for the Department of Corrections. Uh, not only the visual arts, but also arts for programming, um, arts for, uh, I'm a little nervous, I'm sorry. <laughs> arts for You're doing dancing, great. dancing, uh, <coughs> poetry. The, uh, <laughs> Take your time, bro. For poetry and arts. Uh, it, it means a lot to these in individuals to, to have something positive in their lives while they're in prison. And it means it should mean a lot to us on the outside because we want people to be better when they come back out. So if we don't invest in people and try to figure out what is going to help them, then we're failing them. And we're failing ourselves. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I, I'm pleading that you guys could see that arts is a good program in the institutions. Uh, we have 11 institutions. Art from the inside can't do everybody, but if th this grant will be able to, to help other people in different sectors of the state to apply for these uh, grants, money, and, and do this work that we need to, that has to be done. Uh, I'm committed to, to do this work. I'm retired. I could have walked away, but I'm still in the fire and I'm walking towards the fire. Every day I wake up thinking about how can I help our community. So I'm hoping that you guys could figure out how to do that and help me help these people. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for coming back to the Capitol. I know it's not uh, most people's favorite thing to do, but uh, we really appreciate you um, and the work you do and you showing up today. Uh, uh, Senator Umu Verbetten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for being here with us today, um, Mr. Espinosa. I love this bill. That's why I'm a co-author on it. Um, and Senator Mitchell carried uh, that bill on our side in the Senate uh, with us having judiciary and public safety. Obviously, we had a lot of bills, and it's hard to to make time to uh, to hear everything. But I uh, was really glad to see this included in the House bill. And just for everyone's awareness, it's online. Um, 340 in the spreadsheet, um, supportive art. Um, the, the ask was 500,000, and I'd really like to see us um, you know, consider um, funding at that amount. One of my questions for you is just, what would that enable you to do? How many people would that enable you to, to support? Uh, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the question. Um, that money would be able to help out thousands of people in our in our state. Everyone, there's a lot of different people who do different kind of artwork, and you know, it's therapy, it's it's community, it's it's something that we could have conversations about, and and and, and uh, these folks could try to understand who they really are, the talents that they really have, and they keep throwing it away to the curbside. Um, this is a way to keep our, our institutions a little safer uh, by keeping people engaged in, in something positive, you know, having hope for something good to come out. Uh, okay, Senator Umu Ver Verbaten. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to make a few more points, and I had the opportunity just this past weekend to go um, see the Art from the Inside exhibit in person. It was absolutely amazing. You've did, done just such a great job, and seeing um, all the art, not just, you know, paintings and drawings, but um, different things that folks have created. And there were these identity statements that um, the incarcerated individuals made, and there was also some art from folks who are now on the outside and talking about what this means for them. I think with all the other, you know, hopefully very transformational things we're going to do in this bill, like MMRA, right, like we need to have those programs in place that help people, um, the people who are in our systems, like focusing on the people who are in our systems. We need to make sure that um, they have those those opportunities for creativity and um, just uh, to to sort of look inward and to grow. Um, I want to read just one statement from 
um, Luxembourg, who is now on the outside, but um, drew this really um, beautiful piece of art called Two Spirit. And um, in in the inspiration says, uh, the inspiration for the, was um, the theme for this at uh, the art cycle. It felt like a chance to create a piece in a way I wish to be seen. Um, not as a woman or a man, but a human being. Um, and I think you do such great work to um, make sure we recognize the humanity in people that is so often lost and forgotten. Um, when we think about our incarcerated individuals, I just really want us to emphasize um, their humanity. And I think it's, it's art from the inside. I think it's gonna be some of the other bills that we'll talk about today and folks that we'll hear from. I really, really love this work and hope that we'll support it in this committee. Uh, and I'll just remind uh, folks who don't, we had this room uh, in the Judiciary Committee on the House all session. So yes, it's not as nice as your brand new Senate building. Um, but if you do speak close enough to the mics, it'll make it easier for the folks in the audience to, to hear. Um, we're all like trained to do it automatically, but I'm realizing that um, the Senate side maybe does not. Uh, Chair Latz. Well, thank you. And thank you for being with us here today, sir. Um, I'm not very familiar with the program, so could you maybe give me a description of what exactly you do and how it works? Uh, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what I do, when I was in uniform, I would go around the units and put up a flyer stating that we was looking for art to exhibit the artwork, and that what sparked everything. Um, I take the artwork and, you know, we have conversations about what they want to do and where it's going to be at. Uh, I, I do filming of the works so I could bring it back into the institution so that I could see and hear what people say about their artwork, um, pictures as well. Um, the most important thing about all of this is it's about community. It's about creating community and creating a, kind of a dialogue with people so that they could understand who they are and what kind of talents they have. Um, and hopefully to bring healing through the process. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a professional in anything. All I do is I'm the bridge maker. You know, I'll be having uh, folks who come in who are professionals, who are trained about healing and transformation, uh, artists who, to come in to talk to these individuals about how to create art and, and the different variations of, of art, uh, talk about opportunities when they come out, out of uh, uh, prison and into our society and give them a, a pathway of success so that they have an idea of what they could do with their talents. Um, it, it's, there's a lot of different things that we could do with, with, with art and incarcerated folks that we're not even being creative enough to, uh, to see the different things that we could do or they could learn while they're in prison and what could we do for them when they get out. Uh, Chair Latz. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Espinosa. So, um, are, is there, are there studios, is there space inside each of the institutions where uh, inmates who wish to can go to produce art, um, uh, you know, ac acrylics, uh, canvases, uh, you know, how does it work as a practical matter um, within each prison? Mr. Espinosa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's two prison, there's two classes in two different prisons, one in St. Cloud and the other one over at Stillwater. That's where they have an art teacher. There's 15 plus people that could go to that classroom for a whole year. And we have 1,600 people in the institution that are pretty <coughs> creative. Um, there's, you know, this, this art grant would provide other institutions to provide the services that they need for arts it doesn't have to be visual art. It could be, like I stated, <clears throat> other arts. Um, th these folks uh, purchase their art supplies from their own pockets, and they create it in their cells. Um, all my years that I've been working over at the Sti uh, Stillwater Prison, uh, I would do my rounds, and I'd be seeing people engage in, in beadwork and uh, pencil and, and ink and everything else, and they, they create awesome work that which the community doesn't get to see it, you know what I'm saying? And we don't get to see the good things that they could do uh, and encourage them to continue to do good things. Uh, uh, Chair Letts. Um, so 
in two of the prisons they have actual space and art classes, but I assume uh, inmates can draw anywhere they want to when they have the time to do so as long as they have the materials, which it sounds like they have to purchase for themselves, pencils, paper, uh, those kind of things. Um, of course, people could write poetry anywhere they can write, um, but it sounds like it's formalized in only two institutions, and this is a proposed $500,000 appropriation. Um, is it intended that that money would then go to DOC in order to um, hire more art instructors, uh, conduct more classes, make that available in more institutions? Can you give me a little bit of detail on how that would work? Uh, Mr. Espinosa. Those are my intentions. I'm trying to keep the DOC accountable for what they're supposed to be doing. That would be actually a great idea for them to, to increase more programming, and that would be one of the things that I would be hoping that they would be interested in doing. Uh, I've been doing this for three years. I started when the beginning of the pandemic, and you know, through hard times, I was successful in, in doing the, uh, the artwork, and I was able to have people come out and see it with masks and everything else. Uh, Mr. Frazier was there, and uh, uh, Ms. Feist came out to, uh, to, to, to check it out. I invited all of you to come out this, this, uh, uh, this last exhibit that we had, but you know, we had a few people that came out. Thank you very much for who came out. I know you guys are very uh, busy, but you know, it's important for you folks to see what it is so that you could understand what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it's, it's important that we invest in our people because these people come right back out into our society. And if we don't do something, we're failing people. Uh, Chair Lax. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Espinosa. So <clears throat> sounds like your organization or what you do is take the art that is produced on the inside of the prisons and facilitate it being available for viewing by people outside the prisons? Um, or are you involved in trying to facilitate the creation of the art on the inside of the prisons as well? Uh, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you for that question. Yes, inside and outside, that's how it's gonna have, has to happen. Uh, the artwork has been over at our federal courthouse in Minneapolis. It, it, the, the artwork has been expo uh, uh, shown over at uh, museums, the Museum of American Art. The Museum of American Art purchased a piece. It's one of their collections now uh, uh, for their, their collection at the museum. Uh, churches, uh, community spaces, wherever someone would like to exhibit that artwork, that's what I do. Uh, and I also want to do the artwork inside the prison system. I want to do, uh, um, create uh, murals inside the institution. This, this will create a better environment for these in individuals and let, let them see what they could do. Uh, Chillax. Thank you. And uh, for the art that's done, is this, is this the purely creative side of art, or does it include um, it, it, the programming at least that currently exists? Does it include uh, graphic arts and, and other kind of artistic endeavors that could be translated directly to practical workplace skills uh, when an incarcerated person leaves the prison? For example, can will they be able to, are they learning skills that they could take to go paint houses or get employed by companies to create graphics for products um, or other things like that. Uh, Mr. Espinosa. I'm glad you said that because that's the, that's, that's the vision about the whole thing. You know, we have to be creative in how to do the work and what, from one thing leads to another and those are the things that I would love to see the DOC be creative enough and take the risk in, in trying to do those things that you just finished mentioning. So those are my things that I, I have planned as well as not just the art. The art is just a piece of art to, to grab you, to grab your eyesight. But then it's, it's all about the conversation. And the conversation is really difficult because we don't see the value in it for these people. But we will see it in the value in our children or in our neighbor, but we can't see it in these folks. And I do. Uh, Chair Lance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Espinoza. And so can you tell us a little bit about the painting that you brought along with you here? Yes. Uh, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you, Madam Chair, sorry. Uh, no worries. <laughs> that piece is from a gentleman who's up in Rush City. His name is uh, Daniel Gonzalez. 
Uh, he's been doing some time, and he's an amazing artist. Uh, this man could, could have an opportunity if we had graphic design in the institutions, uh, other people coming in and, and facilitating this, these, these kind of uh, programs. Uh, it would be an awesome asset, an awesome tool that the, the DOC could utilize to help individuals when they re-enter our society. And we, on the outside, we have to open up our doors and give people opportunities. You know, people come out from prison and they're not given the opportunities. They're not given opportunities for work or for housing, and it makes it harder for them to, to find, find themselves through that, through that journey, and then they go back into what they know what to do. And that's where we have recidivism. Uh, Chair Letts. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then maybe this isn't a question for Mr. Espinosa, but I'd like to hear from the DOC whether they'd welcome this infusion of funds for this purpose, if they would be able to utilize uh, the funds for the intended purpose as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner, please introduce yourself and then go ahead with your response. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Chair Latz, uh, yes, I mean, I just want to say, first of all, that um, there are a few people who have the heart of Antonio Espinoza, and I think uh, the committees have had a chance to see this. And I think one of the people, one of the things that we see happen with the folks on the inside when they produce this art uh, and then bring it out and have these community conversations, and I think the, the number of people who can apply these skills whether it is graphic art, and I think how do we connect, how do we connect the, the kind of artistic abilities that folks have with other programs that we have, things like you know, computer-based uh, graphic design work and those sorts of things that ultimately really speak to their talents and then can be marketable skills as they get out. Uh, we have been, uh, we are fully supportive. Uh, you know, this has been a challenge. I think uh, Mr. Espinoza has done a phenomenal job of trying to make this uh, happen, even during COVID. Um, and uh, and I could tell you that, uh, you know, we early on um, through the MinCor, our MinCor Correctional Industries Program, a number of our pieces were sold, um, where it was brought out to an outside public store, and members of the public could buy uh, art pieces that that. Uh, people on the inside produce and they received a portion of those funds that is uh, what art from the inside also provides those opportunities and uh, yeah. so he, he's making a pitch here to yeah. <laughs> out to the public as more of a restorative kind of uh, notion uh, but yes we you know, we are supportive we think that uh, we have to create these outside inside programs if we're going to be successful yeah. Uh, Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm so glad you brought that up, Commissioner Schnell, because one of the, the responses I was going to have, too, to the value of the creative art is, um, you know, one is just that folks are really on this journey to um, being the best version of themselves and, and coming out and being able to be successful and thrive and reintegrate into our society. But also with the great work that Mr. Espinoza is doing and having these exhibits is that those of us on the outside are able to see this amazing art and purchase it. And people are, you know, willing to spend a lot on that. Um, as I was going through the exhibit, I'm like, what can I afford to purchase right now? Right. I, I love all of it and I want to I want to um, contribute here. Uh, the exhibit was in person. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're able to then um, receive those funds and um, support their families with that or have have um, something to start with when when they, you know, return to society. Uh, Chair Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, too, had a chance to visit the exhibit. And I think one of the things where you talked about community and building community, um, one thing that I really found impactful was that those of us visiting the exhibit were able to write notes about what a piece of art meant to us and then those were taken back to the people who were incarcerated so what a great way to build community with a complete stranger 
and to let somebody know who created this art that it meant something to me as a stranger and as a viewer and how I appreciated the time they spent um, working on it. So I thought that part was nice. Also, I know you invite a lot of family members um, to come and, and view the exhibit as well and what a great connection and how wonderful for those family members to see other, again, complete strangers enjoying the artwork that their loved ones created. Um, and then I just wanted to mention when we heard this in committee, we had a number of letters in support. And there was actually some really good data on how impactful programs like these are for people who are incarcerated. We had a letter from the Prison Writers Workshop that said, researchers found that disciplinary incidents decreased by 89% after incarcerated people began participating in arts programming in California. A 1992 study of writing and drama workshops in an Iowa prison found that 70% of men who participated showed significant positive change in their relationship with peers and authority figures. And an internal study by the California DOC found that one year after being released, 74.2% of participants in the arts and corrections had favorable outcomes, while the rate for all parolees was only 42%. So, these are really evidence-based practices as well. I think people, when they hear art, sometimes think it's oh so floofy and you know, but these are, these are actually really good statistics too that show how impactful this is. So thank you for your work. Thank you for continuing to testify and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, Vice Chair Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Espinosa, you know, every, every time I hear you tell this story, um, uh, thank you for your service to the state, one. But every time I hear you tell the story about how you lost your partner, and I think about the direction you could have gone in, but the direction that you just, that you chose to go to, and <clears throat> it's warm when you decided to to reach back in and to continue to help people when you could have just said, shut it all off and said, this is who they are, and I, there's no way to rehabilitate folks. You know, I think our country uh, in our state still has a long way to go in terms of how we treat those that are in an incarceral state. Um, and, and I always talk about, I always say that accountability has its place. I, I absolutely agree with that and I'm okay with that. But what we cannot do is just lock people in cages and forget about them and expect that after they are accountable and they serve their time that at the flip of a switch that they're going to be okay, that they're going to go back out into the community and be productive. And these are the type of programs, and, and thank you, Chair Moeller, for listing off that data, right? These are the type of programs that can help folks. I always talk about building a pathway or runway back into the community for success, and these are the kind of programs that can do that. So I appreciate you um, and, and the work that you're putting into this. Um, I know it's with love, I know it's with passion, um, and you do have a big heart and a good heart. And I appreciate everything you're doing. I do support this bill, I've signed on to it. Uh, as you said, I've been to the exhibit. I think it's wonderful. Uh, everyone should try to go out um, and experience it. And mm -hmm. I love the fact that you allow for folks to write notes back to those inside. I recently visit, visited one of our facilities. Uh, Commissioner Snow was there, and one of the things I said to them is that you may be in here uh, for something that you've done, and you have to be in here, but we have not forgotten about you outside and we are uh, waiting and welcoming you back to be productive in the community when you do return. And I think this is something that helps provide that pathway and runway back into the community uh, for productive and positive people to remain in the community and be productive and positive. So thank you. Uh, Representative Feist. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to chime in to say that I'm a fan. As you know, I've been to your current and your previous exhibits, and I just find them very inspiring. Um, one thing that struck me this last time was just how the artists were using art to process you know, their experience and what they had done and really grapple um, with, with their actions. And so I was just thinking about the connection between art and therapy. And, you know, we need to be funding therapy and mental health supports. And I feel like this really plays into that. Um, and so I just thank you so much for what you do. And I support this bill. Thank you. Representative Curran. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Mr. Espinosa, again for this bill. And I, I don't want to appreciate, I don't want to uh, repeat what colleagues have said, but um, take this in uh, 
sort of another direction um, going off of what Chair Moeller and uh, what Vice Chair Frazier said. So we've talked a lot about this session, and we talked a lot this session about rehabilitation and keeping those positive connections with people, providing opportunities to grow so that we become, people become better humans, right, upon release. Um, but I wanted to really touch on the safety aspect uh, inside um, while people are incarcerated. Um, and you know, what it means to keep people engaged, uh, keep exercising your brain um, and you know we've talked a little bit and the data shows you know this this kind of program helps to balance um, the the other attributes of incarceration that that tend to lead to frustration and anger and, and violent outbursts um, so if you could um, maybe speak a little bit more to um, you know we know this benefits uh, the safety of incarcerated individuals and their future um, but if you could speak a little bit more to um, the positive impacts that this has on corrections personnel uh, mr. Espinosa thank you madam chair um, my hopes is to engage have have engagement with our staff our staff needs we all broken everybody's broken you know, people going into work are broken as just as much as people who are who who live there, who stay there. Uh, my one of the things I would like to do is, is to have classes where officers could be part of the class as well. You know, it, it's it, it takes both sides in order to make the whole system work. It's not us better than you. We are all together in this whole this party. You know what I'm saying so. Why can't we play together in a way where we can learn from this experience that we're going through? Me, as a correction officer for 19 and a half years, uh, you know, when I first started off, I, I was, I saw prison as what I saw on TV, right? But when I ex actually experienced it and worked it for 19 and a half years, I, I could see the different transformation on, on people as, as time went by. And, Interacting with folks and having conversations and doing positive things together is going to create a better environment, and that's how the safety is going to be better for for our employees. Uh, Commissioner Snell, uh, Madam Chair, um, Representative Grant, I, I think that is a spot-on question, and I think the reality is there is nothing that will make prisons less safe for everybody, the people who live there and the people who work there, than having folks being idle. And we have way too many people who are idle and caged. And until we start to provide the broadest range of programming and engagement, especially those that have inside outside connection, that's the stuff that we know is gonna make a difference for the safety of our staff, for the safety of the people who live there, and ultimately the safety of the community when people come home. Thank you, uh, any follow up? All right. Um, well, I want to thank you, Mr. Espinosa, for both your service as a corrections officer and the way you continue to serve the community now. Uh, thanks for answering a lot of questions uh, and uh, really appreciate you bringing this forward. Uh, so we're going to move on to the next one. So I, <laughs> you can relax now, uh, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you. May the force be with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, May the force. <laughs> I got, I got my I got my rebel pin on today, so we're, we're good. Um, so the, the next uh, item we're going to move on to is appropriation to the Department of Corrections for phone calls for inmates, uh, members that uh, refers to it's, I believe, line 326. Um, and we have slightly different numbers, but there was a request that we uh, dig into this one a little bit more. Uh, first on the list, I, I know, Commissioner Schnell, we've got uh, you on the list, so if, you're already up there if you want to go ahead. Good morning, uh, all uh, chair uh, members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this again. Paul Schnell, Commissioner for the Department of Corrections. I believe an information sheet uh, is being passed around, which will provide a little additional information. I'm here to testify um, in support of the recommendation in the governor's budget to reduce or eliminate the cost of phone calls uh, for people who are incarcerated in our prisons. We know from evidence and from human nature that preserving strong bonds with family and friends while people are incarcerated leads to more sustained community ties. Exactly what we were just talking about. It promotes re rehabilitation and reduces recidivism and future uh, crime. Studies uh, repeatedly find a significant link between family contact and success when returning home to the community. And you'll see from the information in the handout on this topic but I will reiterate that 73% of those who are incarcerated in Minnesota prisons are parents. 
one in six uh, kids in Minnesota have a, a parent who's incarcerated, the most prevalent um, adverse childhood experience. 40% of children in foster care have an incarcerated parent. Yet we put up a financial barrier between those who are incarcerated with, in communicating with their family members and their communities. The governor's budget recommendation invested $2 million to reduce the cost of phone calls or video visits. Since including this amount in the budget, a recommendation, and as a result of the leadership of Sema, Senator Uma Verveden and Representative Esther Abaje, we have analyzed the cost of fully making phone calls free. That cost totals $1.3 million annually, and the administration supports funding of the proposal at that level. And we are happy to work with the conference committee on how to best ensure that calls from Minnesota correctional facilities are free. There is significant community support for this change, and the time has come to stop charging incarcerated individuals and their families to keep contact with their closest support networks. We also have a proposal to create a family support unit at the DOC, which is explained in the handout as well. Uh, we know that uh, this was included in the Senate bill at one time, but balancing the bill in the Senate, the finance caused it to be removed. For reference, Minnesota does not have a dedicated family resource support and stabilization unit. And the creation of that unit would create a centralized resource for families to help connect uh, community organizations providing services and programming and allow us uh, to work to strengthen bonds between individuals and their families. I would also note that the uh, federal government passed a, a bill uh, about a year ago um, directing that the FCC uh, engage a, a study uh, to uh, set rates um, for uh, re reasonable rates for making phone calls uh, in the prisons. We do not know uh, yet what that will ultimately look like by way of recommendation, but we do know uh, that this has uh, also attracted um, the attention of, of uh, Congress at the, uh, fed the national level, and uh, it, there is action being taken. And with that, Madam Chair, I would stand for any questions you or the committee members may have. All right, a couple members on the list. We do have multiple other testifiers. Are these questions for Commissioner Schnell? Yes. Uh, Chair Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Commissioner Schnell, I just want to understand the cost. It, um, looking at the handout, it says the cost of full elimination of fees is $3.1 million per year, but I thought you said $1.3 million. So, uh, so, <laughs> so if you could just clarify Schnell. that, that would be helpful. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I'm, I apologize. It is 3.1. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. That's it. Uh, Senator Umu Verbaten, did you want to ask a question of? Okay. Town savings. All right. Uh, well, Commissioner Schnell, we're going to move on to some other testifiers. Thank you. Uh, I have Director Janae Bates. Uh, please introduce yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you for having me. I am Minister Janae Bates. I am the <coughs> communications director at Isaiah. Um, and so I'm here most certainly because Isaiah and a coalition of organizations are supporting uh, this measure, but also um, I am personally supporting this measure um, because I have an incarcerated loved one. Um, my husband is currently incarcerated, has been for almost 18 years now. And um, what, you know, even though this bill will not directly uh, impact me because he is incarcerated in Ohio, I can speak directly to the, the hardship that is caused from having to um, pay astronomical amounts of money um, to be able to stay in contact and connection. Um, in, uh, in, in the United States, the, the average income of a family of someone who is incarcerated is $19,000 a year. In Minnesota, we are spending $4.5 million in being able to stay in contact with our loved ones. Um, I pers our, my family spends about $4,600 per year for phone calls. When we're talking about $19,000 um, for a family's income, it is, that is unconscionable. Um, and so 
let's actually talk about what these phone calls do. Uh, for my family, it has meant that these calls have allowed my husband to be able to stay in contact with me um, and to talk about his day, um, to be able to have tears together and laughter together. It has meant that the phone calls have allowed him to, uh, to hear his daughter's voice for the very first time um, over a phone call. It has allowed him to have conversations with his pastor every Sunday, to get to talk to Granny Annie every single day so that he can hear her say the very famous, I love you too, baby. It has allowed for him to be able to have a, a connection to the, to the outside world. And when I talked to him last night um, in preparation to give this testimony, I wanted to make sure that I got his exact words and I asked him, you know, what, what do phone calls mean for you um, and people who are incarcerated with you? And he said, um, I'm gonna get it exactly right for you all. He said, in here, phone calls keep us alive in every sense of the word, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And so I, I really, um, I ask that you all take seriously um, and really truly lean in um, to ensuring that we no longer put the burden on the poorest families in the state um, to, to be able to stay connected to their loved ones, to reduce recidivism, um, to keep more possible to allow children and, and spouses and loved ones to be able to continue to have connections with those who are inside. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for Director Bates? All right. Um, <laughs> you're off the hook. Uh, I have uh, Elliot Boutte is on deck. Is up next. I apologize. We're we're debating how to pronounce your name correctly, and people have differing opinions. So if you could uh, introduce yourself for the record, um, so we're sure we have that right, that would be great. Thank you, Chair Becker. Finn. My name is Elliot Boutai. Um, I'm the senior policy coordinator. Ellen, Ellen wins. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, at NAMI Minnesota, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and uh, we represent people with mental illnesses and their families. So it's hard to think of a more relevant intersection, I think, than, um, than this topic. And there are so many good reasons to fund um, these, th this access to communication. Um, the commissioner already mentioned a number of studies that shows you know, reductions in recidivism, um, and improvements in connecting with families, um, and also mentioned the statistics of um, how many parents are in prison. Um, and there's also lots of Minnesota-specific research that shows that those children fare worse, um, kind of across the board. You know, educationally, uh, socially, you know, higher substance use disorder um, and and mental health issues. And so, connecting children and parents is is really crucial to our whole communities. Um, you know, I think aside from the statistical reasons for um, funding this, um, I think we can all also recognize that it's co just common sense, you know, and whether you've been diagnosed with a mental illness or just been alive for the last several years, um, you know, it's just enough to make someone struggle with their mental health. Um, and I, I think that everyone in this room probably has access to someone that they can come to after a hard day and, and ask for support and get empathy and love. And probably um, we have access to those people, you know, in person. And most people in prison don't have that access to people, uh, especially not easily. Um, and so, you know, some things, you know, when we're talking about funding, you know, some things aren't as quantifiable as others. Um, um, you know, as you already heard, the, the the funding I think will, or the the phone calls, you know, will help people, you know, partners and spouses um, just get through their days, you know, knowing that their loved ones are going to be okay. You know, this will impact schools and children being able to focus just a little bit more in school or just have a little bit more hope or a little bit more peace knowing that their mom or dad is going to be okay. So we, we truly believe that this would improve wellness and safety in our prisons and outside um, and for incarcerated people and for corrections officers. So uh, we are fully supportive of the, the funding um, and policy around this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up I have David Ojeda.
Good morning. Please introduce morning. yourself for the committee and then proceed with your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is David Ojeda, and I just want to start off by thanking you for hearing my voice in this matter. I want to focus my struggles on three aspects of my struggles with the cost of the phones while incarcerated. I spent 96 months incarcerated in the DOC, and in those 96 months, I've spent over $40,000. <laughs> I would like to tell you that I'm a proud father of eight, and I'm a grandfather of one granddaughter, and I've spent majority of that money to be able to stay in contact with my kids and my family. And now that I'm out, by spending that money and by having to cash out my 401k and having to cash in all of my investments that I had made prior to going to prisons, now I'm struggling financially to be able to do these things that I have the opportunities to do with my children now, now that I have time to. I made the choices that I made to invest the money that I did at the time that I had so that I could maintain relationships with my children and with my family. So I don't regret the choices I made, but this is where I am here today. And I'd just really like to thank you guys for hearing me on this. Thank you very much for your yeah, testimony. No problem. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, we'll move on to uh, member discussion. I know, um, <laughs> I will just say, uh, you know, I've, I've carried the Healthy Start Act and other bills around um, the impacts on the children of people who are incarcerated. And I think, um, you know, wherever you are and how you feel about people who are on the inside, I think um, disrupting those cycles of trauma um, for the children of people who are incarcerated is incredibly important. So um, $40,000 is a lot of money to spend on phone calls. Um, <laughs> uh, Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Madam Chair. I completely agree um and i'm wondering if we have the letter from the coalition to pass out to folks or if that's okay. in our packet it should be in your packet the connecting families connecting Minnesota. families yeah if everyone just wants to take a look at that i i just wanted to highlight that this legislation is called connecting families for a reason um because that's really what it's about um and as you said the toll this takes on the entire family on the kids when they're disconnected and they um, are unable to communicate with their their parents is just heartbreaking um, so it's really about keeping our families connected keeping that connection to the outside ensuring that people can really thrive um, when they are released and you know we heard um, uh, about the just <laughs> enormous cost to family forty thousand dollars is just absolutely wild um, but I was even looking at the fact sheet from um, DOC where you know an incarcerated individual might be working a job at 25 cents per hour whereas the phone call is 75 cents so you've got to work three hours just to get 15 minutes with your family um, and part of you know i think part of what the the overall cost is and why this this um way of 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 you know placing this burden on our families is so terrible is that um you know the the companies charge these these awful high amounts and then um our government has been really complicit in that and getting a commission and then we use that to pay for a lot of other programs and we get in this terrible cycle of like well, we use the fees to then fund these other things. And I really want to commend the commissioner and all the staff at the DOC who are like, that's got to end and we're committed to this and we want to ensure that we're keeping families connected. But that's that's part of, you know, why this model has been so terrible. Um, so I'd love to see us support this and, and keep our families together. Thank you. Thank you for member discussion. Uh, Representative Curran. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I just wanted to speak to, um, you know, we talked a lot about keeping um, keeping those relationships alive outside so people have something to look forward to. Keeping those um, connections, of course, really important for folks to stay focused on, on their goals while incarcerated. And I just wanted to highlight, too, that um, something else that we're doing uh, this session is um, opening up those communications too so that folks can find resources that they need that they might not already have. Mm -hmm. And so that would include uh, contacting or uh, searching for mental health providers, uh, medical providers, uh, uh, things of that nature. And so I just wanted to highlight that as well that um, of course staying in communication with those that we know and love is, is crucial. Um, 
to rehabilitation, but um, so is making sure that folks have all the resources that they need um, to stay healthy, both mind and body while in prison too. And so um, that, that's a big, a big piece of this too, is um, making sure that folks don't have to pay for that themselves. Um, and so just just wanted to highlight that for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on to the uh, next item. Uh, so we're gonna move on to funding for civil legal services. I have Executive Director Dory Rappaport uh, here to testify and answer questions if we have them. Uh, members, I think there is also a handout, um, this one that's more of the horizontal one that was in your packet um, from legal services as well. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself uh, and proceed. Good morning, NM Chair, Chair Latz, members of the committee, Gonna move up my microphone. Please. You don't have to completely eat the microphone, but the closer you are to it, the easier it will be for other people to hear you. So, oh, a little bit. there we go. I'm Dory Rappaport. I'm the executive director of Legal Aid Service of Northeastern Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the funding for civil legal services. I also want to acknowledge Jesse Nicholson, um, Executive Director of Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services is here today um, and watching remotely are the other coalition directors of the Minnesota Legal Services to express their gratitude for your continued consideration of significant funding for civil legal services. I have good news and I have bad news. <laughs> so the good news is Civil legal service attorneys, paralegals, support staff are doing work that are changing lives. Um, it's hard to have clients come and testify in front of you today and I, I hope you can understand that. So I'm doing my best by sharing some stories. Um, a story from just two days ago from an attorney at my organization. Um, there was uh, a mother who called because she has an eviction um, because she was unable to pay her rent because she had lost her job and she was trying to find housing and had been turned away and turned away because she has an eviction on her record. So she called to see if she could get it expunged and this isn't easy to do. Um, but after our attorney had an opportunity to talk with her more, she has a son who has disabilities and the, disability, and the services that he was receiving, he could no longer receive because they don't have housing. Mm. They're homeless, so they can't receive those services. Oh, wow. So what do you do? So our attorney decided to take on the case and make what felt kind of like a long shot argument <clears throat> and was able to get this ex eviction expunged. And now this family has an opportunity to get housing and her child who has disabilities has an opportunity to get his basic needs met, which without our assistance, that would not be happening for this family. They'd still be unhoused, he wouldn't have the services he needs, and there'd be nobody else to help. That's just one example. There's another example from um, my colleague in uh, Northwest Minnesota sent a story today about a paralegal. So we do what we can with our attorneys, but we have to rely on paralegals and paraprofessionals to provide services as well. And a paralegal was able to help somebody who'd been denied their disability benefits. And um, the paralegal was able to, in, to um, get these benefits reinstated. And here was the situation. This woman was living in rural Northwest Minnesota in a shack where at one point she had water but the well broke and she no longer had water. She just basically had a shelter above her head. This isn't a place where she could apply for a bunch of housing. I mean, this is what was there for her. Um, she had a friend that offered her to stay in an outhouse where she could come in and borrow her shower for a while. Um, but this is a disabled woman who had been out of work for four years and had no income and continued to be denied disability benefits. So this paralegal, was able to make the case for her and got the benefits reinstated. And now she finally has a chance at having adequate housing with running water to have her basic needs met. 
This is what our attorneys, our paralegals, our support staff are doing every day. And that's great news. The bad news is that our turnover is worse. I mean, since I've been here last, our turnover is worse. We have an office in a rural area that now has lost over 50% of its staff because we can't pay people what they need to be paid. And the work is intense. Our caseloads are tremendous. People are leaving for other public sector jobs where they can work remote, where they don't have clients with these traumatic situations, and they get paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 better. And it's not just attorneys, it's support staff. It's staff doing other roles in our organizations. We're losing them. And the people that we do have are not doing well. They're struggling. It's really a crisis right now. We need to stabilize their salaries and we need to hire more staff. And I'll tell you what happens when we don't help. So I was um, talking to a, a colleague and partner of mine last night about, um, so they, they work for a community mediation program, which is part of what we do in civil legal services as well. And um, they were holding a restorative circle um, meeting with individuals, many of them who were unhoused. And there was an elderly veteran who is unhoused that was there and eventually was able to share that because of an unresolved matter in another state, he was unable to have housing and unable to get his VA benefits. Mm. And it's complicated, but this is a system where we should be able to help that individual get that resolved and help him find housing and help him get his, his VA benefits reinstated. So what did we do? We do what we do. We still, even though we can't help them, we don't have the attorneys and the paralegals and the support staff to do this, we make phone calls. I called a board member who's a retired attorney, retired public defender, many of you probably know him, knows people in every state and made some phone calls. I just got a text while I was sitting right over there that they are getting this matter resolved for this veteran because two people care so much because our system isn't working. This is the way we're operating right now because our system isn't working. This is not a civil justice system. This is a patchwork. This is broken. We are, as that board member says to me sometimes, in the business of begging. We have volunteer attorneys that will step up and help and we are so grateful for what they do, but it is not enough. It doesn't fill that justice gap. You have an opportunity in front of you today to fix this very broken system. And we are so appreciative of what you've done so far. But you really have an opportunity to make a difference now. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, we'll move on to member, member discussion. And I thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Rappaport. I know, um, I guess I will just say, you know, when I, uh, <laughs> took the gavel in this committee a couple of years ago and it, you know people were still in the habit of just asking for whatever small percent they thought they had, might have a shot at getting and I know it was actually a struggle for me for you all when I asked you to sort of what would it actually look like if we fully funded this and I think um, these are big numbers and big increases percentage wise but I think it speaks to the um, decades of disservice we've done to low-income folks in our state um, and that's how big the problem is but I know that it I because I, I encourage you to dream now it's it's you know there's the the give and the take and now it's um, you know there's some 
hit that you take uh, emotionally um, to allow yourself to go there knowing that we might not be able to get there right away. And so I just, I appreciate you coming back and, and testifying today. Uh, member discussion, uh, Senator Wesley. I want to thank you for being here today. Um, and, and I could certainly speak to the need for this in family law. I, I'm a family law attorney. I think the statistics, if I remember them correctly, is roughly 70% of people who appear in family court are unrepresented. And the way we have dealt with um, representation for people in civil matters is we've relied on pro bono work by attorneys, um, and that just doesn't work. Um, so for me, I'm a solo practice attorney. I'm the chief cook and bottle washer. I do everything. And there are a lot of attorneys who would love to help but just simply do not have the bandwidth to do it. And oftentimes, my understanding is legal aid and SMURLs and, and so on have to triage the cases. And so the ones that they're taking are often orders for protection. It's um, uh, family matters involving custody of children. But you have other people who don't have kids but have really complex needs for representation. They can't afford counsel. And so what ends up happening is this burden falls on our judiciary to do their very best to not cross. They can't give legal advice, but they try to help people through the process. But this ends up creating demands for the judiciary who already are overburdened um, and, and having cases that have one or both parties that are unrepresented. There's this whole cascading effect into the system when we don't provide people with representation. And I know we've tried, at least in, I think in Hennepin, I don't know if they do this in Ramsey as well, they have um, limited scope representation, they have attorneys volunteer to do limited scope representation to appear in early neutral evaluations or in other capacities. But again, it's this patchwork that also places pressure on resolving cases. <laughs> um, attorneys come in and I'm here for this one thing and they're maybe leaning on people to reach agreements. And I think we see this on the criminal side also with public defenders with massive caseloads. And so I guess I would just say if, if we want to be in the business of pursuing justice, ultimately, just results for people, um, this is a critical piece and we don't have a constitutional right to representation in civil matters, but I would submit to my colleagues and anyone else listening that if we're talking about your right to have a home, if you're talking about what happens with your kids um, and what your relationship with your kids will be post decree in a family court matter, these are all really, really important things. Um, and so I and we have budget constraints, and I get that. I would just want to say that as, we're, as we do prioritize things, and we have to, this is really important. And I just want to thank you for your work doing the best that you can in a system that is really struggling. Uh, Senator Verbaten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Rappaport, for really just like bearing your soul with us. I know it's hard to have to dream. And I'm wondering if you can um, speak to this a little bit more because it really is such a crisis that with the funding, you know, you're looking at salary parity before you can even start to increase the amount of services that you can provide. I mean, that's how severely underfunded uh, civil legal services are. So just wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of speak to that and what it would mean to increase by this amount versus this amount and when we finally get to the place where you can then <coughs> service more people. Uh, Ms. Rappaport. Chair Victor Finn, thank you, Senator Umu Verbaten. Um, you're absolutely right. So the, the numbers um, that we're seeing here for both the, the Senate and the House, you know, civil legal services will focus on that salary parity progress because we have to. For those that don't know, we are still trying to make sure that, I'm just using staff attorneys as a place to start. It, it's really similar for all staff in civil legal services, 
but they are starting on average at 60,000, which is the lowest in the public sector, which is below our public defender colleagues and partners. Um, and we are trying in this next fiscal year to get them to $70,000 for starting salaries, which will still put us at the lowest amount for salaries. But it's, the pro it's progress that we have to make, or like I said, we're going to lose people. Um, and then same with the salary parity we have to focus on in fiscal year 25. Um, the numbers that we're seeing um, don't really account for additional funds in the tails um, to allow us to keep moving up those salaries. I'll just point that out. And we do appreciate that the numbers that we're seeing in the Senate will, or the numbers in the House, excuse me, will allow us to start with some capacity building right away. We need it. We're, we're focusing on salary parity because we have to take care of the staff that we have, but part of also taking care of the staff that we have is addressing those caseloads, and we can't address those caseloads if we don't have more staff. So this feels like in our six-year plan, this feels like a rate that we can work with what we see in the House numbers um, for fiscal year 24 and 25. Um, and that's different in the Senate. And we appreciate the numbers because we will work with those numbers for salary parity progress, but they aren't, we're not seeing a potential for increasing capacity there as much. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, anything further, Senator? Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak to this one? Uh, Chair, was saving you for last, Chair Latz. Chair Latz. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Rappaport, for the work that you do and that all of your colleagues do. Um, it, it, uh, it's life-saving work, literally and figuratively in a lot of ways. Um, and it's not visible work either. Uh, it's not work that makes the headlines. It's not work that shows up on the news stories and on, on the media um, or on our phones in that regard. But uh, it's life-changing for individuals that you're helping. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot of volunteer work in the courts, and I see it on the criminal defense side. Um, and uh, it's just as impactful on the civil side, even though, as Senator Westland noted, there's not a constitutional right. Um, but I think we have a moral obligation to, make, to, to provide adequate resources uh, for civil legal services. <clears throat> and uh, our Senate numbers reflect the budgetary constraints um, that we are facing, um, <clears throat> and it's 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 unfortunate. We we all have limited budgets. We're going to have to be making choices. Um, but I have to tell you, and I guess I shouldn't have been stunned, but I I still was. I had a business lobbyist in the Capitol yesterday who happened to catch me as I was walking through from one meeting to another who complained about the avarice for money this year. So I looked up the definition of avarice <laughs> to make sure I got it right. Extreme greed for wealth or material gain. He was rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Absolutely stunning. So when people complain that with 17 or 18 billion dollars so-called surplus, 12 of which is one-time money, and of the remainder you still have to factor in inflation, which eats up most of it, and after at least six years of failing to meet some of the minimum needs of our state with regard to funding. When people ask, why are we looking for additional resources 
to fund things that have been in the pipeline for a long time and have gone underfunded, in some cases dramatically underfunded or unfunded. This is why. Now let's have the discussion about where to find those resources. But the question of why we're looking for those resources or whether to find those resources, this is why. And frankly, so is much of the rest of our budget. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, uh, and I'll just say, uh, Chair Latz, um, you know, when I first asked folks, both the public defenders and civil legal services, to tell me what would it take to fully fund your work, like, it shouldn't have been a crazy question to ask. But we've all sort of the forces <laughs> push down on us to think that we can't ask for the things that we need. And we need to ask for those things, because if you don't ask, we're never going to get there. And I think I would also point out, um, even with these really, like, admittedly large increases percentage wise, if you look at the handout, um, the base um but the number between the base so the first line on our handout and then the very bottom line of what a fully funded so actually keeping up with the market plus um continuing to gain capacity is an even uh <laughs> I, I can't do the quick math but i mean six to seven times what we currently have in the base um i mean and the folks that are hurting are the low income folks this is what we're talking about today that's who you serve. So to, like, to make no mistake, that is who is being harmed by not funding this. So um, you know, to sort of add on uh, to Chair Latz's comments. So thank you so much for coming back here. Um, I know uh, it's hard, and I'm, we're taking you away from other work you could be doing, I'm sure. So um, thank you uh, for everything you do. And please uh, pass on our thanks to others uh, who work uh, in civil legal services. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, uh, we'll move on to the next item. We do have a couple testifiers lined up on this one on uh, judicial staff pay. Um, first, I have uh, Andrea Meitler. Meitler. Please uh, introduce yourself and then proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Andrea Meitler. Thank you, Madam Chair, representatives and senators. I'm a law clerk for Judge Shireen Askalani in the 4th Judicial District. I am here in support of the market adjustment for law clerk pay. We are um, currently assigned to serious... Uh, Ms. Meitler, if you yeah. could sit a little, but just put a little bit closer. Sure. Can you hear me now? Much better. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you like me to start over? Or can I keep going? I, why don't you just, you can keep going. It's fine. Okay. Thank great. you. We are assigned to a serious felony caseload, which includes murder, criminal sexual conduct, crimes against children, and gun cases. Um, this morning, even, we are currently in trial on a criminal sexual conduct case, so we'll be back at that shortly. <laughs> I work 40 hours per week, um, but that's actually not enough to do my job. I often work evenings and weekends just to do the bare minimum um, of what's required of me. The work also takes an emotional toll. Um, this results in secondary trauma, due to the workload and the nature of the cases. Doing my job well includes engaging with tragedy on a daily basis, which includes listening to testimony, viewing evidence, reading complaints. No one prepares you for listening to testimony of an eight-year-old girl describing in detail how she was sexually abused by her mother's live-in boyfriend, or to hear the 911 call of a victim who had just been shot moments before, barely able to breathe. And that's what I do as a law clerk as I listen to that day in and day out. While the work is difficult and it's intense, I love my job. <laughs> I love my judge. Um, I love what I do on a daily basis. I have a great relationship with my judge. Um, I'm getting an experience and mentorship that will set me up for the rest of my career. Um, and I know it's just a launching pad. I would stay longer. Um, I've been there for about a year, I'm a little bit over. But the current compensation is not sustainable for me. Um, unless changes are made, I won't be able to afford to do this work. Um, I know many fellow law clerks are in a similar position. Um, I currently babysit on nights and weekends to make ends meet. Last night I didn't get home until 10.30. Sometimes that includes 
logging onto my work email while I'm there. I'm watching other, ki other people's kids in order to be an attorney in the state of Minnesota working for a judge. This is not what I saw myself for when I went to law school. Um, I don't have margin for my car to get towed or to have unforeseen medical expenses. Um, and honestly, it's truly sad um, that this is where it's at because I love my job. I love what I do and it's incredibly important work. If my loans were not currently in forbearance or if I had a family, I could not afford to continue in my employment. I'm currently a clerk because I care about the work. It matters. I value public service and giving back to my community. Um, it just really isn't sustainable and something needs to change. I really appreciate your time allowing me to address you this morning and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, members, any questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next testifier. All right. Same topic. Same topic. Yeah, we've got a couple more testifiers on this one. So thank you very much for your thank testimony you. and thank you for your service. Uh, Carrie Strombeck. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Members of the conference committee on Senate file 2909, good morning. My name is Carrie Strombeck. I'm a court operations associate for the state of Minnesota in Benton County Court Administration. I'm also the Teamsters um, Union Steward. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on Senate file 2909. Let me briefly tell you about court administration. Basically, we're the production line of the courts. If there is no court administration, there is no court. We work the counter helping the public file their court paperwork from evictions and the expungements that we just spoke about <clears throat> and small claims to adoptions and custody matters to harassment restrainings and order for protections. We help the crying mom who just found out she's not getting her kids back. We assist the upset defendant who is late for court and now has a warrant. We take payments. We give court dates. We maintain the judge's court calendar. We clerk the court hearings in person and of course now by Zoom, which adds a whole lot more issues and much more. If there are no court administration employees, who will help the public get access to justice? Who will take their phone calls? Who will receive their payments? Who will clerk the court and keep the judge's calendar going and on schedule? That's our job and that's what court administration does. Court administration. Court administration staff are asking, almost begging, that you fully fund this bill at 9 and 6 percent. We work really hard for the state of Minnesota and do the best job we can every day. We have been bombarded with change throughout COVID with the courts asking more and more of us and stretching us to our max, thus forcing employees to leave for the pay they deserve for the work that they do. Data shows that as a result of our uncompetitive compensation structure, staff departure rates have nearly doubled over the past four years. The number one reason employees give for leaving the judicial branch is salary. New employees are being hired at starting wages higher than seasoned employees just to attract employees, which in turn is causing poor office morale and a low retention rate. Employees don't stay with the branch anymore like they used to, which is leaving offices short staffed and more work and stress on the remaining employees in the office, making our jobs more difficult. We went years without any raises during the lean years when there were budget deficits. We were told to basically deal with it. There was no money for us and that it'll come around. Our wages have never been recovered. We went without a raise last year and fell further behind. There is a budget surplus now. We just want what's fair. We want to be acknowledged for the hard work that we do. We want the judicial branch to be a sought after career once again. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions for this testifier? I don't think so. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Uh, uh, President Mary Tice. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Tice. Tice, all right. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Uh, thank and you. if you could sit, yep, there we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Perfect. Mr. Chair and this committee. 
I appreciate this opportunity to come up and speak with you today. I have been um, a proud Judicial Branch employee for the last 20 years. I am the president of ASME Local 3688, which covers the Judicial Branches 2, 4, 6, and 10. Um, we have um, we have been running short staffed for a very long time because the testimony you just heard is true. People don't stay because of the wage. I live, I work in a very well ran and well managed division. And, the, and it's true, people leave because they're not paid enough. We, um, <clears throat> People don't understand that when they say pool, that that's an, a 9%, for example, um, addition to a pool of money that is used for wages. But that does not guarantee 9% increases for staff. We don't know, come review time and come bargaining time, what we can expect to get and it's it's very frustrating we are the backbone of the judicial branch we we do think keep things running we're the schedulers we prep the judges we meet the people at the counter we do everything district court could not run without its line staff and the sad thing is we are proud government employees we we serve the public because we want to and we enjoy our work the majority of us have went to college for some form of law or law enforcement law enforcement and so we are in careers in a career path that we chose to do unfortunately my co-workers are in low income housing because they qualify my coworkers are approved for economic assistance because they don't make enough money to take care of their families. My coworkers have second and third jobs just to make ends meet. And it's very sad because as all of you know, we work very hard to serve the public and we have all kinds of vicarious trauma that we're exposed to over the years and we're dealing with people on a regular basis who are victims and who are having probably the worst days of their life and we're trying to get them the information they need direct them in where they need to go and and hope that the justice system takes care of them so we um uh, and you're right there was no funding for increases in our pay this last time around, um, you know, it, we did survive a very long pay freeze and we continued to come to work and deal with it because we wanna do this line of work. We also um, have had very small increases over the years. There's been two and a half percent, there's been 3%. All of that gets ate up by our insurance costs and everything else. And we have staff that don't go to the doctor, even though we have very, very good benefit packages, they don't go to the doctor because they can't afford the copay. They can't afford the upfront deduct deductible. And our staff more than, more than anything need to be able to take care of their mental health based on the stuff we deal with on a regular basis and they can't afford to. So what we're asking is we really need the judicial branch pool to get this nine and six this time. And we also need to be able to let the staff know who are barely making it that, you know, it would, I would love to be able to go back after a bargaining session and say, yay, you get a good review, you're gonna get your 9%. But I can't do that. I can't tell anybody ahead of time what to expect. We don't get a cost of living increase anymore. And like I said, we don't know what we're gonna get for 
for annual increases. So we don't match competitively to other state agencies in our compensation. And we um, really need to get this full funding and we really need a fair system that appropriately compensates judicial staff. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions for this testifier? Uh, Vice Chair Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I think you, you've, you've highlighted something for me that I've always thought was problematic, that we, we have the appearance of these great benefits, mm -hmm. but not, a, not the actual ability to actually access these great benefits. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that you can't guarantee that individuals will actually get the increases. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, President Teese. We are on a pay per performance review system. It's like a point system with a, re with a review that has core competencies. So each competency, there's a required improvement, there's a meets expectations, and there's an exceeds expectations. And each one of those is worth, uh, um, you know, it's one, two, and three points. A perfect review would be 15 points. And that would guarantee you whatever that top increase was um, allotted to be for that for that biennium. If and many and people have testified about this and have complained about this over and over again, there are supervisors out there across the state that will not give it seats because they don't feel anybody works that hard all the time. There are people who have gotten very good reviews the year before, and then they all of a sudden get a new supervisor and they're barely meeting expectations now. So this paper performance system that we have is, is more suited for like a widget factory. Are you getting out everything you need to do uh, in order to, de to deserve a raise. And that's not appropriate for the kind of work we do. It's just, it, it's, it's not fair. Uh, Vice Chair Frazier. Thank you, thank you for that. And did you also say there's, there's not um, uh, cost of living increases? Nope, we haven't had a cost of living increase since prior to merging with the state and being a county employee. When I was a county employee, it was awesome. I had a cost of living raise, cost of living raise to look forward to. I had something, <clears throat> something concrete that I would look forward to if I had a good, um, had a good performance evaluation. There has always been contract language to deal with folks who aren't high performers versus having a point system that there's like no guarantee what you're gonna get. It depends on the mood your supervisor's in. Hey, uh, Vice Chair Frazier. So I just w wanna be clear for the record, the individuals that are not getting these um, exceeds expectations to get the um, increases, these are not, and there may be some, but, but most of these folks and you can correct me if I'm wrong, most of these folks aren't on like improvement plans or anything like that. Uh, President Tease. No, a uh, performance improvement plan is not a form of discipline. It's supposed to be a tool to get you back on track so that you can perform, so that you can meet expectations with the rest of your crew. Just one more. Sure, Frazier. And, and so thank you for that clarification. Um, so in most of these cases, these individuals, uh, there is no discipline or no issue. It's just the supervisor decided not to, to not give them the exceeds expectation, which would then preclude them from getting the increases. President Tease. If you get all exceeds expectations, so it's usually between um, 10 and 15 points, I believe. I don't have it in front of me right now. I apologize. But the higher you score, the bigger increase you're gonna get. 
the lower your score, you're gonna get less of an increase all the way down to uh, denied or delayed. All right, we're gonna move on to the next testifier. Um, we do have a session at 11, so um, wanna make sure we have time uh, to ask any questions of the courts and get their testimony in as well. Um, but I do have uh, Vice President Goldmink. I don't know if you have anything extra to add to what's been already said. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Hi there, so um, good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the conference committee. My name is Kevin Goldmink. I'm the elected vice president of Ask Me Local 3688. As she had spoken before, we represent a roughly 600 court employees, um, but that only covers four judicial districts. Um, so I'm a, a court operations associate in the fourth district, uh, Hennepin County, and I work in the centralized appeals unit, um, and I also assist in the centralized call center. Um, thanks again for letting us testify today. We do a lot of work which allows our legal system to function efficiently. We clerk the courtrooms, we process the paperwork from parties, we help the public in person and on the phone, and we provide exceptional customer service. Um, as Mary said, we are the backbone of the digital branch, um, but when it comes to compensating us for our work, we are not treated as valued team members. We struggle to make, meet, make ends meet Financially, we live paycheck to paycheck. We have colleagues <clears throat> who qualify for public assistance because their public employer pays so little. We deserve better, and we deserve a living wage. Um, at this point, we can't afford to see stagnant wage increases. We've seen too many people leave the courts for better pay, and these are high quality workers. Um, so we would like to see that the legislature prioritize significant funding increases for the judicial branch so we can negotiate for competitive wage increases, improve our retention for, of high quality workers, and provide a living wage to all court employees. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, gonna go ahead and move on to uh, the overall judge pay and judicial staff pay. Uh, Mr. Shorba, if you wanna come on down. And thank you also to you, you both, uh, for serving our communities as well. Mr. Sharbo, welcome to the conference committee. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, and then go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the conference committee. My name is Jeff Shorba. I'm the state court administrator for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. I don't know how I could say it better uh, than what you've heard from our last testifiers. The judicial branch has always been, I would like to say, very judicious in what we come forward with as a request to this body because we understand the circumstances that you are under, the pressures that you are under. During the last biennium, we came forward with a 2.5% increase in the first year. That was given out in July of 2022. So we are going now on two years without permanent increases for our staff. Um, our departure rate has increased more than 50%. The number of applicants is over 70% down uh, from the last four years. And we, I don't come here crying wolf. Uh, you know that I come here with numbers and reality and we are in a state of crisis. As you just heard, we not only have people that cannot fill our jobs, but are doing some of the most difficult work um, across the state. Um, you heard some examples, not only from the law clerks, but also from our staff. They are dealing with people who are in crisis, people who are desperate. Uh, before you get to a judge, before you get the privilege of having potentially a, a legal services lawyer, you're coming to that person at the counter and asking for their help. Uh, and that is really people in a state where they don't know where to turn. And we are trying our best to provide that help, but it's very difficult when you have somebody who is there for a year and then leaves. And then we get somebody new, and then they leave. Um, our starting uh, range for pay is $18 an hour. I just drove back from Rochester. I can tell you I saw many, many signs for people to do much easier work for $22, $24, $25 an hour. So we are beseeching you to please fund our request at nine and 
Um, we did not take it lightly. We know it's a lot of money. We know it's a big increase, but we think it's absolutely necessary because of the gap that we have created. So it's been two years now since we gave increases to our staff. They've fallen behind uh, not only um, other employers, but other public sector employers. I could tell you all day long stories that I hear from staff who have gone down one floor to the county attorney's office and are making, as uh, Mary T said, $20,000 more. Um, and we're not gonna be able to survive it much longer. So that is our top priority. We have some other one-time funding in our bill, but I think we're mostly here to talk about compensation. So I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, and, uh, and I will say too, just I had a couple of people ask me about it um, over the last couple of years and in, in full transparency, I, I had requested to our fine, uh, our fiscal staff to break out the numbers for the judges and staff, sort of recognizing that there is a difference there. And we'll also just say uh, for <laughs> public education, our, you know, our state constitution, you know, specifically delineates the um, setting judge salaries as a legislative role. And so I thought it was important to sort of pull those things out. Um, I'm not sure if you want to say anything um, to that, uh, Mr. It Chalka. is. I mean, one of the reasons that I think this branch is very transparent in what we're asking. You'll find other parts of state government give you sort of a lump sum number and say, just fund us for operations or something. We're very specific because we understand that um, you set the salaries for judges and you have to be very specific for that. So that's why we're transparent about needing this nine and six. And I understand they're two very different groups of people. We've taken the approach that we want to come in uh, in a uniform manner, but obviously that decision is up to you. Uh, member discussion. Uh, Vice Chair Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Sherwood, thank you again. It's always good to see you. I always think you do a great job of, of kind of laying, laying things out for us. I do have a question. I, we just heard some very compelling testimony from, from staff, and they're, they're in that group outside of our, our judges and the judicial branch. And my question is, you know, we talked about the struggles that we have with our budget targets here and um, the things that we need to invest in. And in hearing these staff uh, and those compelling stories and what I believe they need and how we've underinvested in them for probably decades now, um, would, it be, would it be our understanding that uh, from the judiciary branch, that leadership there would say that we should prioritize making sure that we get the staff what they need. Uh, Mr. Shorba. Madam Chair, um, Representative Frazier, um, obviously I care about both the staff and the judges. I can talk a little bit about the judges as well. They have fallen behind as well. We're no longer in the top half of the nation in terms of our salary for judges. Um, I just spoke with the state court administrator, I believe in South Dakota, they were giving their judges well over 10% increase, um, as well as North Dakota was giving a bigger increase, I think, than we're giving. But um, obviously, our staff are the backbone, as Mary said, the backbone of our work. I mean, they're the ones who are the first door to justice. And so it's really, really important. But you can't have justice without qualified judges. And uh, we are seeing the applicants for our judgeships go down. Uh, one judgeship opened uh, four years ago. There were 33 applicants. This time there were five. Now, I'm not saying those five applicants aren't great. They, they may be great. But when you're not going to get attorneys who are in private practice or you're getting mostly you know, public attorneys, you're losing a little bit of the variety we need to operate. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you how to prioritize. That's your job, uh, unfortunately for you. But uh, I am going to say that both of those are really high priorities for the branch, and that's what the Judicial Council decided and why we put forward our request. Uh, any follow-up by Sheriff? Yes, Rachel? please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that uh, response, Mr. Schwarber. I guess my follow-up would be um, in regards to the uh, lower number of applicants that we're getting for our judge positions when they're open. Um, is the feedback that there, we're getting less applicants because the salaries are just not comparable? I think we're getting feedback on, oh, Madam Chair, Representative Frazier. I think we're getting feedback on two things. One is the pay. Uh, why would I give up, for example, my private practice? Why, if I'm an assistant county attorney, I'm making more than a judge now, I'm already in the public sector, why would I go do this judge job, which 
is very hard. I think that's the other thing we're hearing. It's very difficult. Um, it's very strenuous. We went through COVID. We are now trying to meet the needs of our customers by trying to do as much remote stuff as we still can. Some people don't like that. They'd rather be in a courtroom. So we're putting a lot of stress on our judiciary. Um, and I think that was clear from some of the testimony you hear. It's a lot of change going on based on what was going on through the COVID <laughs> epidemic. So to come and take that job when someone, you know, I like to think of it this way. When someone's going to schedule my day, maybe this is true for all of you, but when someone's going to schedule my day eight hours a day and I have to be sitting on that bench or doing something, I lose some of that sort of freedom I have when I'm doing my other kind of job. And that is a trade-off. And I think people are recognizing that these are interesting jobs, they're prestigious jobs, they're good jobs, but they're also very stressful jobs. So I think those are the two things we're hearing mostly. Uh, Thank you. Any follow-up otherwise, we got a couple other people on the list. I'll, I'll let it go. All right. <laughs> Uh, Representative Curran. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Shorba. Um, just kind of uh, looking at or listening to the different testimony we had, and President Tease had mentioned that um, you know the the wages in the locker clerk realm, you know, don't exactly match up when we look at other agencies. But keeping this within judiciary, um, you know, we're talking about we have judicial staff who are on economic assistance, and um, hearing you know the $18 an hour wage, the quick math on that is just over $37,000 a year. Um, how does that compare when we're looking in our judicial system? Um, what is the current salary band then for judges? Uh, Mr. Shorba. Madam Chair, Representative Curran, uh, judges at the district court level right now make around $169,000. All right, uh, any follow-up, Representative Curran? No, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair Muller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to follow up, Mr. Sherba, on a question uh, or a, a statement you made about a judgeship having fewer applicants. And was that a court of appeals position, Mr. Sherba? Uh, Mr. Sherba. Madam Chair, Representative Muller, no, that was a district court position. Uh, thank you. Chair Muller. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And what uh, district was that? I believe it was in Mr. the- Mr. Shorba. Madam Chair, Representative Muller, I believe it was in the first district. And I can get you that information directly. Uh, Chair Muller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just also, do you, are you aware of any judges who are working two or three jobs at a time to make ends meet? <laughs> Mr. Shorba. Madam Chair, Representative Muller, um, I am not privy to that kind of information. We do have um, out of, uh, out of judge income reports that our judges file, but most of them involve something like uh, performing marriages or doing something like that. And I can't testify whether they need to do that to make ends meet. Um, I am much more aware of some of our staff having those issues. Well, now they got competition <laughs> to perform those I marriages. Know, I saw that, so, yes, uh -oh. thank you. <laughs> Uh, any follow-up, Chair Muller? Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, and I'll just say I, I don't think we're anybody is doubting the important work that judges do and the excellence of our judicial branch and the tremendous amount of stress and pressure they're under. I'll, ju I'll also just say that I don't think we should ever expect a salary to be equivalent to perhaps the private sector. Um, and, and you gain a lot. You might lose some freedoms, as you talked about with being a judge, but you also gain a lot. People want to be judges for a variety of reasons, serving the public, having power and control and making really important decisions in the lives of Minnesotans. So while you might lose some freedom, there's also some very great benefits for people to apply to, to be a judge. And we're just trying to strike the right balance here. So thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, Chair Lex. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I know that the uh, representative from the District Judges Association is, is present in the room. I wonder if we could ask her to testify yep. specifically with regard to the judge's request. Yep. No, I do, I do have her here. I wasn't sure if you were. <laughs> Had you next on the list. You can come on down. Thank you. And they'll have some comments. Yep. When and this is Mr. Shorba, do you have any questions for Representative Shorba? Can we let him go sit in his other seat? I have no follow-up questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, defense rests. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, that may be the most attorneys that have ever been on a conference committee, even at this level. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Haas, uh, please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Nancy Haas. I'm a lawyer with the law firm of Poole & Haas here today on behalf of the Minnesota District Judges Association. 
Um, I echo the importance of the investments in the judicial branch that you've heard about today and how important they are to um, move forward. On behalf of MDJA, I just want to address two critical items that you received um, a letter from our president, Lois Conroy, um, and those are in the areas of the market adjustment for law clerks that you heard about this morning, and then the support for the request of the nine and six for staff and judge pay, which is supported by data. I think there were two points worth mentioning in the letter. One is, um, and as you just heard, there is trouble recruiting lawyers, especially those from private practice to the bench. And we've been doing a lot of surveys this um, year from, on behalf of MDJA in, in our judicial compensation survey to which over 230 judicial officers responded. Most judges stated that a pay increase is necessary for their continued work on that bench. So with your help, we can provide compensation for our staff and judges, um, commis commensurate it with the value they bring. So thank you for your consideration of both of these items this year. All right, uh, Chair Letts. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Ms. Haas. Um, can you give us a little bit of detail on uh, pay increases over the last three, four years in terms of percentages? I know uh, Mr. Shorba uh, alluded to this as well, but my recollection is that the judicial branch as a whole, including the judges, came in actually with a 0% increase request at one point in recognition of the, the pandemic uh, budget issues we had in the state. Uh, Ms. Haas. Uh, Madam Chair and um, Mr. Chair, um, in the last biennium, um, when the budget was being put together, we were faced with a huge deficit. And so um, the Judicial Branch and the District Judges Association made a request for a 3% increase in the first year of the biennium. Well, excuse me, it was actually the second year of the biennium. But the legislature decided to fund the first year of the biennium and then zero in the second year of the biennium. So when you see the nine and six this year, that is um, as a result of that lack of that 3% in the second year of the last biennium. Yeah, and I, I know I had asked uh, our fiscal staff a similar question earlier, and I know it was two and a half in 19, two and a half in 20, two and a half in 21, and then zero in 22. Does that, uh, that sound right to you? <laughs> All right, um, further follow-up, uh, Chair Latz. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and. You know, some of the members of the committee know, I guess I mentioned it in our first meeting. I'm in court almost every day interacting with district court staff who are outstanding and the judges who are outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, but they know the work that I do here and they tend to pull me aside and say, here's what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and I've got, you know, the staff are telling me how much of a challenge it is for them. And I'm aware that some of them are working extra jobs to make ends meet. <clears throat> uh, and I see the stress in the courtroom among the people who are forced to be there because they're on the calendar. Uh, and some of them I talk with in my volunteer work because I'm, I'm helping defendants through the process a bit even if I'm not representing them. That's some of the work that I do there. Um, <clears throat> What may not be quite as obvious is the stress that the judges are going through at the same time. Because ultimately, the judges are making the decisions that are affecting the lives. They're choosing which parent is going to have custody of the children. And they're choosing whether to send someone to jail for 30 days or for 96 months. And they're balancing competing requests and, and pressures from defense counsel and county attorneys or city attorneys, and uh, they're balancing the input and the in interests of the victims um, <clears throat> in cases where that's applicable. And ultimately, they're the ones who are responsible for the final sentence. And as we know from the media, if someone doesn't get a long enough sentence in the minds of some when they get released and they go out and commit another crime, the judge is the one who gets blamed for not giving a long enough sentence. Um, so I don't say this to create, you know, a ton of sympathy for the judges. It's a job that they sought and have been appointed to. But it's also a recognition that they have a very unique role that they play in our system of justice that none of us, frankly, have to face, that no one else in the judicial system has to face. Um, and I don't think it's fair to say that they are only working or that they're working just nine to five kind of jobs. Um, 
I, I know judges that are telling me that they are working 60 hours a week and have been for two years because that's the only way the work is going to get done. And part of it is because they don't have top quality enough law clerks to, to draft, make the first draft for the opinions that they're writing. Uh, some of them are um, not taking vacations um, because if they do, it leaves their colleagues short. Someone's got to cover those calendars. Uh, judges are retiring as soon as they are able to when they, they hit 65 and they're out the door. I've got judges telling me they can't wait for the next year and a half to come. They're not going to retire early, although I think some are, but they're not going to come back as retired judges to fill in on the calendars when there's a shortage because they're absolutely burnt out. Um, and so, yes, people go in to you know, apply to be judges because it's a prestigious position. There are people who are in the public sector right now who get substantial pay increases when they go to a judgeship. And there are others who take substantial pay cuts to be judges. And it's not necessarily at the end of their career the last five years as a capstone. Some of them, are, they're leaving uh, law firms mid-career because they want to be judges. But we also need them to be willing to go onto the bench because they're the ones that have the experience and the knowledge in the complex litigation, um, in, the, in the complex civil litigation, in the complex real estate transactions, in, in, in all of these different areas um, that you wouldn't necessarily come across in the county attorney's office. You certainly won't come across in the public defender's office um, and civil legal because they tend to focus their, their work in certain categories aren't going to come across that. Yet when there's a business dispute, we need to have judges on the bench who have the capacity, the knowledge, the understanding, and the experience to make informed and just decisions in business disputes too. And a large proportion of our litigation in court are disputes between businesses. Um, so I say this because, well, I, I fully agree that we ought to be compensating our, our line staff in the courts well. I see how hard they're working. I understand that they're underpaid. I'm not sure that it's fair to give short shrift to the judges in the same process. Um, and in the end, I think we ought to be paying all of them fair compensation for the work that they do, the value they bring to our judicial branch and to providing justice for the litigants that come before them, some voluntarily, some not voluntarily. I mean, if you're a criminal defendant, you'd, you didn't opt to show up, to be there, to be required to show up in court. If you're a civil defendant, you didn't initiate the lawsuit, but you're trying to figure out how to do, deal with it, right? Um, this is our system of justice. It is an independent, constitutionally independent branch of government. <clears throat> and, um, I think we have an obligation as a legislature to, uh, to make sure that they're all fairly compensated uh, for the work that they do and respecting their unique roles in our society. Uh, so that's why the, the Senate um, uh, came in at nine and six for, for all of the employees. Um, and we did put in a, a separate line, and I know that the House did too, for law clerks in particular, because <clears throat> I know the law clerks are doing, first of all, it's a misnomer. Um, and it, that's an historical thing. Uh, even the United States Supreme Court law clerks are called law clerks, but they are judicial branch lawyers is what they are. They've all graduated from law school. They've got their law degrees. They've passed the bar. They're practicing law in the judicial branch, assisting judges. Now, some of them are doing clerical work because we don't have enough clerical staff, <laughs> because we're not providing enough pay to the clerical staff to attract and retain that talent. Um, but, uh, and when we have law clerks who are, you know, they said, uh, you know, the pay range that they're going to get, well, if they stick around for two years or for three years, they're going to get up to 
a high enough pay to make it worth it to stick around. Um, but they leave after a year um, because the opportunities, even in the public defender's office, in terms of pay, are greater. Yet they're an absolutely cl critical component of a judge's ability to, to do the judge's job. Um, so I guess I'm making a pitch that we make sure that we, we fund the judicial branch employees as a whole um, at the nine and six. Uh, they've taken it in the chin more than any other public employees did during the pandemic when we funded it. And so that nine is catch up. It's entirely fair. Um, and I don't think six is out of bounds uh, for, the, uh, for the ongoing funding. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess um, <laughs> to, to state you know, the position of the House, if the target was higher, I would give everybody what they want, but it just isn't. I keep telling people I can't make $10 be $15. It just is what it is. And um, I do think it is important to delineate the difference between the folks who are working multiple jobs and on public assistance versus the people that are making $169,000 a year. And that's not to disparage judges whatsoever. It's just the reality of what it means to have that salary and be in the top 15% of wage earners in our state versus the person who's babysitting um, or, you know, a barista on the weekends or whatever it is um, to make ends meet or the people uh, on the other end of the spectrum. I know it was really upsetting. I'll just like say this publicly. It was really upsetting to a lot of people two years ago when I did split up the staff number and the judge number. I will say I think that should always be a separate number partially because the public might, might not be aware of this, but the Constitution actually says a judge's salary can never go down constitutionally. We could be in the worst deficit in Minnesota history and judges' salaries could never go the opposite direction. Once we make that choice that it goes higher, it has to stay at that number that is in our state constitution. So, you know, part of it is a just a budgeting fiscal, you know, being careful in budgeting. Um, but, I mean, we have to weigh all these things and the reality is if we give the full nine and six, well, then we can't do the things that we heard were so important to civil legal services and this is why this is so hard. Um, but I think, you know, I think we all want to do the right thing and if we had a bigger target, we'd be investing more in all of these things, but we just can't do it all. And that's, um, that's why I thought it was really important. We gotta, I always, I always depend on both the prayer um, and uh, the pledge taking a little bit of time, but we do have to get over to the house floor. Uh, but I do think, um, I hope this was helpful both for the public and for committee members as we're sort of weighing the things and we can't do everything. Um, you know, where do we, who do we fund and how much and what is gonna do the most good is always um, my goal uh, at the end of the day. Uh, with that, we are in recess.